Sandra Pancho. I go by the pronoun she, her, and I actually work under the alias Sandra by design. So I would say that professionally, I'm an inclusive design consultant, strategist, and educator. And what that means in practice is I help teams all over the world to design more inclusive and equitable solutions, meaning solutions that can serve more people and can break down barriers to access. On a personal front, I am, I will describe myself uh, in terms of my identity and lived experiences. So I'm a Latina woman who was born in Colombia. I grew up in the US, lived there for about 20 years and moved to France nine years ago. Um, I do benefit from both many privileges and, and many disadvantages as well tied to my identities, which I'm sure we'll be able to kind of unpack as we go along. But I do like to be very explicit about my lens, which is that of uh, a woman who is cisgender and heterosexual who benefits from the privilege of having lighter skin, but who also is an immigrant in multiple countries, so the US and France. Um, I'm a foreigner with an accent in France, which has influenced kind of the way that I see and walk through the world here in this country for the past nine years. And uh, I'm also a cat lover, and I used to sing in a band, which I've recently left, but I would consider myself a singer as well passionate about that and um a family oriented person and fantastic welcome sandra so i mean you have already outlined like you are very much of an experienced practitioner when it comes to designing for social impact and inclusion so of course i'm very curious to understand what's your definition of inclusive design yeah this is it's hard to answer this because it's a topic that is undergoing a lot of discussion and I could even say maybe debate in the space of, I was going to say in the space of inclusive design, but there are so many related terms, design justice, equity centered design, community centered design, participatory design, social design, equitable design. Am I missing any? <laughs> there are a lot. And so I would say that I like to personally use the word inclusive design because with the word inclusion, it already provides kind of an entry point to thinking about whose voices or whose perspectives we may be overlooking, especially just in the design industry, but in the design process in general, which can expand beyond the design industry itself. And so thinking of inclusion is kind of like, how can we bring these overlooked or historically and systematically excluded voices into the fore. So that to me is the kind of inclusion lens, but like I mentioned, I see it as an entry point. So it's more about inclusion being a starting point, which diversity is clearly an aspect of that. When we bring new voices in, we want them to be representative of a wide range of people, backgrounds and lived experiences. And then when we think of kind of the next steps, it's thinking of how do we get go towards equity in our design practice and process. So how can we, like I mentioned in the beginning, break down historical and structural barriers uh, that people face, especially those who face have the most disadvantages in society. How can we break those barriers down so that they can access the solutions that we build? And then ultimately, as we move along this kind of journey, thinking of justice, you know, how can we actually start to transform systems transform culture um, to really be able to get to a future where there is a lot more fairness there's a lot more equal treatment and equal access to resources to knowledge and to opportunities so that is kind of how I think of the inclusive side of design and then the design part I like to think of design as something that anyone can do meaning that you don't have to be a designer on paper with a certain set of credentials or a diploma uh, to do design, that's kind of the professional definition of design, which is very Western and Eurocentric. So for me, design is something that, you know, you do with intentionality, um, you do with imagination, and there is some sort of craft, but I think that we probably should redefine what it means to, what it means to bring something uh, into the world, and craft can take uh, many, many forms. So long-winded answer, but Inclusive design, designing something that can serve more people, break down barriers. And with design, it's, you know, anyone can be a designer. Um, but of course, knowing that the world of professional designers do wield a lot of power. So that's kind of usually where we start. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and that's very interesting. We are talking about inclusive design, but also like you're already hinting, how can we make design more inclusive as a as a profession? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so much. It's uh, of intertwined. Course. Intertwined. Yeah, Ex exactly. And you have already like mentioned a lot of like terms that we use when we kind of talk about inclusive design, like you mentioned social design, equity centered design, but also like sometimes when you are starting off like your let's say research and deep dive on inclusive design, like you stumble up on concepts like accessibility or universal design so how would you say like these concepts relate uh, and might overlap to inclusive design but also how do they differ potentially yeah and that's a really great point and in a lot of the work that i do especially around education so i i work with people who are either designers or are tangentially kind of connected to design and try to get them to understand the terminology, which can be the hardest part, exactly like you say, and I think the common, maybe not misconceptions, but the common confusion arises with the term universal design versus inclusive design, and then throwing in accessibility into the picture. And the way that I try to work people kind of, or navigate people through those definitions is to think of kind of the history behind these terms and I don't wanna say I'm a design historian, I'm not in any way, shape or form, but I like to think of, you know, when we think of the lived kind of environment or the kind of physical environment, and we think of things like curb cuts or um, trying to think something like closed captions. And these are solutions that have emerged, you know, in the past 150 years or so. And when I say 150, I mean like the last hundred years and the last 50 years. And so for instance, curb cuts, it's basically what enables um, a easy transition between the sidewalk and the street. And so it's basically like a ramp that you can easily kind of navigate across if specifically if you're in a wheelchair. But the idea behind this as well is that other people benefit as well. So if you are using a stroller, if you have a heavy suitcase, if you're using a cane, if you have or holding a lot of things, um, and might be caught by surprise, you know, at the at the edge of the sidewalk. Like these are sorts of solutions that in a way are universal, meaning that they were designed with people with disabilities in mind, but the benefits can extend to a much broader group. And I think that's kind of what comes to mind when I think of universal design. And it's kind of this idea of like one size fits all. So one solution for as many people as possible. And I think where this gets a little bit confusing with accessibility, especially as we think of our transition into kind of digitalization of the world. Um, so a lot of times accessibility is not just the accessibility of our physical environment, but of digital products and services. A lot of times people default to, um, you know, how can we make websites or apps accessible to those who may have hearing or visual impairments. And then we start to think of, well, there are laws and regulations that actually dictate that, you know, uh, website owners or big companies need to adhere to a, a certain set of guidelines, so the WCAG guidelines, for those of you who may have heard of, of those. And this is where I feel that that's accessibility, which a lot of times in the corporate world tends to fall under the lens of compliance and regulation. And so in that sense, it's not about for instance, questioning maybe the biases or questioning kind of how privilege shows up or thinking about the history of exclusion, the history of oppression. So thinking about bigger things like, you know, white supremacy or ableism or misogyny or the patriarchy. Um, rather, it's more about how can we ensure that a certain group of people can access a certain groups of a certain segment of products and services. And, and that to me is kind of what I see more in the accessibility space and universal design tends to fall into that. So how can we make one specific thing accessible to more people? Yeah, and to yeah. me, inclusive design is much, much broader. Sometimes it means that we have to create specific solutions for specific groups because they have unique barriers, they have unique needs that we can address with one, per, one specific universal solution. Long-winded answer, but hopefully that kind of covers. Yeah, so exactly, like yeah. trying to connect like a lot of like uh, really insightful like inputs from your side. Like, would you say then that inclusive design starts by looking at those people who might be potentially excluded and designing for those people? And one outcome eventually could be like a universal design in the sense that 
it becomes the solution for many more people than what you actually designed in the first place? I would say like, a, I would give a yes and to that because I think there are definitely so many examples of technology that has been designed. And I think technology first, because that's where we see kind of more obvious and, and public examples. But so technology that's created, and I'm thinking of examples right now in my head, but just thinking of like technology that's created for someone who, um, I'm just thinking of like algorithmic bias that may show up. And when you have algorithms that rely on facial recognition engines that uh, have specific racial biases kicked in, the fact that um, we're specifically looking at the barriers that maybe people of color or people with darker skin tones may face, for instance, with getting a mortgage or with getting access to credit um, at a bank or getting access to a certain level of service, if we were to address that first and foremost, it's not only improving the experience for them, but it's creating a more just and fair system for everyone. I wouldn't necessarily call that universal design, but I really think of it as like, I don't think of inclusive design as something new or like something separate from design. I think of it as a new way or an enhanced way of doing the design that we do today. So it's more about kind of integrating new considerations, um, evolving certain processes, adopting a new mindset, maybe tweaking some of your processes. And in some cases, it might be revamping how you approach the design process altogether. But I don't see it as a separate thing on the side that only certain people can do. I kind of see it along a spectrum where it's like we can all embrace a more inclusive approach to how we design. Um, there may be people who are more specialized who will be able to go deeper and, you know, be able to kind of push things to the next level or maybe transform and revamp completely, you know, how, how things are done. But I think at the end of the day, in terms of the outcomes, I think that my philosophy is centering those who have been marginally excluded systematically and historically over time. Um, and then understanding that that's going to have benefits for for others but but not necessarily so it's not a case of like a zero-sum game that if we design for people with who have been disadvantaged you know the people who do have advantages are going to be disadvantaged in some way like that's not necessarily what I mean but just because we are for me it's kind of being in taking on that mindset of justice that we may be improving the lives or increasing access for those who are marginalized and that doesn't mean that everyone else has to benefit from that because it's kind of we're in this state of, in a way, kind of reparations or like re recalibrating kind of power and access. And to me, that's um, that goes beyond kind of what, what you describe is actually commonly used as a business case for inclusive design, where we design for the marginalized or we design for a certain group and everyone benefits. And to me, that's overly simplistic. And completely leaves out the concept of justice out of the discussion so no, yeah. that's that's amazing and thank you because it's really like clarifies like what's the lens that we should be putting when we think about inclusive I'd design say like <laughs> it's tough you say we should and I like not to use the word should in my language because I think mm -hmm. that it dictates kind of how people should think but I for me it's more like it's my philosophy and I've try to be in community with people who share that philosophy, who share those values. And I think it again is dependent on what are your goals? What are your, like, what's your vision with design and with designing a better world or designing for good. And yeah. to me, it's, if we truly want to transform power dynamics in society and redistribute it, it being power to those who do not have it, we have to be at, taking that lens, but again, I'm not here to say for you to do inclusive design, you have to have a justice lens. That that perhaps some other people may, may think that I, I'm kind of more of the, you know, carve your own path, but be mindful that if you do go on a path where you are not looking at the bigger picture, you can actually create more harm in the process, so. Yeah, now very interesting also about like how um, the power of words what, what are like mm. the assume yes. like implication of like using words no, so that's very relevant and Sandra like you already hinted a bit like at the beginning about 
the history you know like the origins and I actually think like there is always a lot we can learn from like the history or like the origin of a particular concept so could you maybe just like very briefly uh because I think we could spend like a lot more time like what has been like the the history of of inclusive design how did we look at inclusive design in the past how it's now and how you see it evolving as a practice yeah, and again, I want to caveat this by saying I'm not a historian. I don't know the ins and outs of all of the kind of practices of inclusive design. And I would say like, even what's difficult about talking about the history of design is that the way that we're taught history, just in general, but specifically in design in school, it tends to focus on only certain types of design and certain types of designers. And I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but it's focusing on kind of Eurocentric approaches to design. Um, it centers designers primarily from the West and from the global North. And so for me, in terms of like, again, like I mentioned, I see inclusive design as this entry point into something much larger that moves us towards social justice. Um, and I would say that thinking of kind of in industry, what inclusive design has looked like, like to me, the starting point was what I mentioned at the very beginning, like the physical environment, we saw adjustments being made to, you know, the arrival of elevators, like uh, curb cuts. There's another word for this that I is escaping me right now, but it's like the, um, I will have to look this up afterwards because I do not, I cannot think of the word right now, but all of the kind of um, things around affordance that have been factored into the environment to allow, for instance, for people with side environments to navigate, to understand kind of where, uh, the, the sidewalk ends where the street starts in the metro, you know, being able to understand when the stairs are coming, those sorts of things kind of, I would say that that's what I see is kind of the starting point. Again, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, um, but to me, that's kind of the starting point of more kind of universal design. And I feel that over the years, as I mentioned, you know, as we've entered the digital era with accessibility, a lot of the times inclusive design has been kind of folded into accessibility efforts. So for instance, designing uh, apps or website experiences that are accessible for those with who have impairments or who have disabilities of some kind, that was seen as inclusive design. And I know, for instance, Microsoft was one of the pioneers behind inclusive design. You know, they invested a lot of time and resources and they've done a lot of work publicly. Uh, to raise awareness on inclusive design. Like they built a lot of the inclusive design handbooks. They set the path for other tech players to follow. So to me, they're kind of one of the um, kind of go-to actors to look for who have really done a lot of great work in pushing this forward. But I would say that what's gotten kind of overlooked in this is that there's actually been a lot of people who have been involved in community-centered design and in what we call equity-centered or also participatory design practices, meaning like how can we bring the community, so people who are not designers, so people who are coming in with their lived experience and that serves as expertise. And to me, that's something that's been happening for many, many years, but you would never find that in any sort of design history book. And it wouldn't necessarily be 100% tied to inclusive design. But I consider that to be part of the history as well, and it informs my practices. So, so yeah, I would say it's a tough question to answer because I personally do not know the ins and outs. I'll be very honest. I don't know the ins and outs of design history of inclusive design because it has so many different definitions. It over intersects a lot with accessibility, which has gotten so much more prominent with, you know, digital um, and I would say a lot of the times where we see inclusive design kind of shaping up in the industry, it's been in tech and especially with players like Microsoft. So to me, they tend to be maybe a bit centered in the story, but it leaves out a lot of the kind of more ground ground level and like grassroots work that's been, been done by a lot of people whose names are escaping me, but uh, a lot of which is covered in a book called Design Justice, which I would highly recommend. By yeah, Sasha. Thank you. Sasha. She tells us about kind of the community level design that has been happening for many, many years. Um, and a lot of that work is actually extracted by big corporations, not mentioning any names, but um, that's where, again, I think this history question is really tough because it's kind of like, it's tough to answer because you have to think of like whose history and who's the one telling the story. And we don't always have access to 
um, to multiple perspectives on that. So, yeah, yeah, totally. No, perfect. And I feel like now we have kind of unpacked uh, what inclusive design is all about within like all the complexities that this entails and a bit like the evolution. But why should people care about inclusive design in the first place? Why designers should care? Why businesses and why society in general? Yeah. So, I mean, there are two kind of philosophies around, you know, making an argument for inclusive design. And the most common one that we hear about is definitely the moral argument or the moral case for inclusive design, meaning that, you know, if we do want to shape a world that's more just, that's more equitable, where, you know, people feel included, people feel respected, people feel a sense of belonging, you know, we have to have, um, like we have to embed these principles of inclusion and of equity and of diversity, not just into organizational culture, but also into our practices. And for designers, that means really thinking and questioning, what is it that I'm actually designing? Who am I designing it for? Or ideally, who am I designing this with? Um, and how am I designing it? And really being able to kind of unpack all of that. If you know this moral kind of impetus is something that can drive people forward to doing this sort of work. And we do see that there are a lot of companies that are finding that, um, you know, company values are very important for talent uh, acquisition and talent retention. We see that Gen Z, um, there are many kind of studies out there that show that people of younger generations are looking to work for employers who do have kind of, um, who care and invest in social kind of impact work, who have a strong set of company values, who care about diversity and inclusion. And so I would say, see all of that kind of as falling a little bit under the moral, moral argument of, you know, we do this because we want to do better and because we see the potential of, especially in business and not, and I'm talking kind of private sector, this, I think this applies as well to public sector and to the social sector of really being able to, you know, make the world better place but being able to kind of um, analyze and examine our practices. So that's kind of one side of things. The other argument is the business case. And this is where we hear a lot of the, you know, design for one, extend the benefits to many. And that's the argument of with, you know, with inclusive design. I was about to say universal design because that's actually what it alludes to. <laughs> with inclusive design, you know, you're able to increase your market reach. So you're able to penetrate new markets. So people who have been historically overlooked who do have high, um, just who, who do have disposable income, meaning they have purchasing power that isn't fully being realized. And we see this argument a lot with um, people with disabilities or disabled folks, where they say, you know, they hold trillions of dollars in terms of economic power. And then you have to think of their care caretakers and their family, who I think it ends up being like one in six people in the world or something like that. And then thinking of, you know, their immediate kind of, um, whatever, uh, what's the word, their immediate uh, entourage, there we go, their immediate entourage who also want to support brands that are creating uh, accessible products and services. And so that actually means that the purchasing power involved, it was something like $3 tr tr trillion, or some, it was a monumental number. And so I see that thrown around a lot. <laughs> And then you also have kind of the innovation argument that, and it's true, you know, there are many studies that show that teams that are anchored in inclusion, meaning where people feel uh, valued, where they feel that they have a voice, where there's a sense of belonging, where they feel safe. Uh, so in terms of psychological safety, that leads to improved rates of collaboration, that leads to greater productivity and efficiency, and in turn, that helps to retain talent. And so there's kind of a lot of arguments around cultivating cultures of inclusion, um, improving diversity in terms of representation and organization, because there are kind of ties to performance uplifts. And there's even a big McKinsey study that maybe you've heard of or others who are watching this may have heard of that shows that when we have greater diversity, especially at senior levels, you see an uplift even in financial performance. When you compare those who have the most diverse kind of boards and leadership teams and those who has the least diverse um, boards and leadership teams. And this is something that cuts across different countries as well. So it's not just US centric. So yeah, so that's kind of the business argument, meaning overall, like there are many, many benefits, but I think the problem with 
arguing or getting not arguing that's the wrong term but like convincing people to do this work is that sometimes they get overly overly tied to the benefits of the work and the, they don't realize that the journey is actually a lot more challenging and that there aren't necessarily shortcuts to this and when you do take shortcuts your I, I call this like the social harm footprint the equivalent of this carbon footprint it's like basically like you're chasing after positive impact and you know these material and business benefits but you actually might be creating a lot of harm along the way that tends to lead to a net impact that may be zero maybe negative when you think of like the historical negative impact especially that many big companies have not just on people but on the planet as well so so yeah so it's um it's a sticky kind of topic to work through convincing people to believe and to buy into the power of inclusive design because you can easily walk down the path of what we call performative diversity and inclusion where people want the surface benefits surface benefits but they don't want to do the deep work required I'll stop there. <laughs> so otherwise yeah. I can keep going I can keep going for a long time no and I and I think it links with like one kind of devil advocate question that I had but also some experiences like being a designer myself but also like of course like knowing a lot of in-house designers um so I mean one of probably like the foundational principles underlying design it's empathy so I just want to unpack this because I think it's going to lead to a very interesting conversation for uh first like um, why should I care this I'm already like practicing empathy uh, as a designer yes and what's interesting is that I did a talk on as related topics, it was on how narcissism drives bias and equi inequities in design. And I talked a lot about empathy and the importance of humility. And um, I'm drawing from work from others, but in this case in particular, drawing from the work of Oveta Samson, who uh, was, he's, she's a, a pioneer in ethical AI practices, but she's written a lot about empathy. And I remember reading one of her articles about the bastardization of empathy. And she's not the only one who's talked about this, but it's really inspired me and kind of changed my frame of thinking around empathy, along with some other thought leaders who have, and practitioners who I follow. But she talks about the fact that um, research shows that it's actually very difficult to practice empathy with people you don't know. And a lot of the times designers tend to believe, and i challenge this belief because I think it's a false belief, but they believe that spending an hour with someone and most of the times in an artificial kind of environment leads to truly getting to know someone. And especially when this exchange exchange can be actually transactional. So people getting, you know, an Amazon gift card in exchange for their time. Um, but there's kind of a very extractive or capitalistic quality to to that work and then secondly Oveta talks about how the research shows that it's difficult to create kind of this sense of empathy with someone who doesn't look like you or who doesn't act like you so someone who is very different from you in terms of lived experience and identity and that you know we actually need much more diverse teams in order to be able to do uh, empathy justice and then lastly the fact that for true empathy, you know, we really need to be spending a lot of time with people and we need to be, of course, detaching from our own, our own worldview. And so this is kind of the notion of bias, which is thrown around a lot. And I know that designers and researchers, they tend to say like, you know, well, we're reducing, you know, the, or we're mitigating bias through um, the types of questions that we ask, our posture, the interpretations that we make, you know. And I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of privilege that goes into saying something like that because a lot of the default assumptions or even just the defaults in design. So in terms of thinking when we create personas or when we interpret data, our own kind of worldview, our beliefs, our lived experiences are undeniably embedding themselves into our interpretations, into our design artifacts, and into the outcomes, so the outputs of our design work. And I think that it is, um, there's a bit of hubris in thinking that you are 100% detached or 100% neutral, 100% objective. 
because many, many, many research studies show that that's not true. So I challenge that. And I think that in my opinion, and this is kind of what my talk was about last year, uh, last week, I should say, is that designers need to be practicing a bit more humility and understanding that because we have such low diversity in the design industry as a whole, and when you start to do more and more research, especially with marginalized groups, and you start to, for instance, touch on topics that may be very sensitive or that may be tied to trauma or, or where there might be some sort of power dynamic at play between the researcher or designer and the end user or the person you know who you have in front of you. All of that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like we are all kind of internalizing different belief systems from the world and we're projecting those out through our words, through our behaviors, through our actions. So I would say that empathy is not enough. There are many limits to empathy. And as Oveta Samson says, we bastardize empathy and think that our work allows us to truly dig deep and understand the person's worldview and their needs even better than they know themselves. And I'd argue that that's not actually the case when we're spending an hour um, of our time with people and we're not consciously and intentionally unpacking our bias and our privilege in the process. Yeah, very, very deep. And I would say so true, like when you start to reflect about our processes and actually our psychology and we work as human, our brains and cognitive biases that we cannot really get rid of. And I would like to connect it, actually, because you mentioned when we were talking about like the business case for, for inclusive design, know that many times, let's say leaders or companies in general, like are really like looking after like the, the final, like the candy at the end. But actually, this is, is a journey that, that has a lot of challenges. And also sometimes like when we practice design, like going broadly design uh, in general, not just inclusive design, sometimes like we struggle also like to convince uh, others within the organization to actually spend time in the problem space and conducting research to practice empathy or whatever and beyond empathy. So I'm wondering, like, based on your past experiences, like, what's your approach or how can we handle that? Because we're adding another layer of challenges there. Yeah, I mean... There's a couple of things like I because I work as a consultant, I'm usually on the outside kind of looking in and I try to as much as possible tie the work around inclusive design or even just design in general, because there is this exactly as you're saying, there's this question of how do we get design as a whole to be recognized um, and to be fully valued in an organization. And in order for you know senior leadership to allocate the resources necessary to do design work justice. So having enough time to do research, having enough time to you know, do co-creation, having budgets, you know, to be able to do a certain amount of research and testing before you deploy something or before it goes and gets developed, if you know, we're talking about digital products and services. So so I think, yeah, you have to kind of appeal to what leadership cares about. And so that's important for designers as a whole, whether they're doing inclusion work or not, to be thinking about, you know, what do business leaders care about? How does the work in design transfer or translate into business value? And again, this, this is where I say that's the sticky kind of situation we find ourselves in, because in order to do inclusion work, if we're only leading with the business value or the business outcomes, it may detract from the work and it may lead us down a path of extraction and exploitation. So you kind of have to take a very careful approach to leading with the business um, value, which to me is kind of the little cherry you know, that you wave, uh, or what is it, the carrot, the carrot on the stick. I, I'm really bad with expressions, but whatever. The way that you kind of hook someone in is kind of saying like, look, there's potential here for us to um, really take advantage of all the great potential talent that we have in the organization, because if we get people to work better together, if we give people room to speak up, to critique, um, to bring in voices to the fore that may be overlooked, you know, we're opening up new opportunities for innovative and creative ideas, which in turn helps to kind of accelerate innovation as a whole, to lead to new sorts of products and services. Um, I mentioned already, we see improvements in collaboration and efficiency. So kind of leaning into that business case is a really great way for people to at least get some buy-in and some curiosity from senior leadership. 
And to me, kind of the second step is thinking about how can I bring, create some sort of proof point. And I think proof points come in many shapes and forms. There could be external proof points, meaning you bring in case studies from either um, players or, or organizations that are similar to yours, people in your same industry, or those who are outside of your industry that perhaps the company may look at, look as uh, or look at as pioneers that they can emulate. So really thinking of if you put this into business terms, kind of like the first mover advantage. Um, or the kind of differentiation from competition. So that's kind of a second um, way of using proof points, mostly proof points that you get externally. The, the other kind of side to this is figuring out how can I assemble maybe a small team and it could be just like a small working group. And I see this working well in either small organizations, but also large organizations and just getting people who are really passionate about this to either find some sort of project where they can experiment on this or um, figuring out if they can just start to kind of weave it into some of their day-to-day -day work and be able to build some sort of, whether it's an internal case study, some sort of thought kind of leadership paper or some sort of resource that they can start to diffuse internally, which can get kind of the wheels turning, but more in a grassroots sort of way. And once you get kind of that grassroots movement, you'll start to have kind of more examples of potential impact, um, not even potential impact, but examples of actual impact that you can start to kind of aggregate in a way and take that to leadership to show like, we've been doing some testing, it's been at grassroots level, here's what we've been able to do. Imagine if we were to get actual resources. So if we were to get um, maybe an inclusive UX researcher, or if we want, were to get someone who we were to get someone to come in and you know train us and allow us to go deeper imagine you know kind of the results that we would get seeing already this great momentum that we have with these smaller experimentation and seeing also like the industry like bringing in again the the um the proof points from from the industry and from competitors so that is kind of the approach that i like to use of kind of driving buy-in getting getting some influence in of course you can appeal to people's values as well to their good hearts, um, to kind of um, this desire to to be to do better in business and to really bridge purpose with with profit. Um, and then one other thing that I would add to this is figuring out how can you connect this if if this exists, you know, with any diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that are happening, especially more on the talent and the people front. And so I think that there's actually a lot of connections that can be made. So let's not just focus on bringing in talent that's more diverse um, or helping people from underrepresented groups rise in terms of seniority, but how about we actually extend the work to our business practices or extend the work to product and innovation um, and design in, in our organization? And can we maybe get some resources from that or get some support or at least get some visibility from senior leadership on, on what we're doing? Because without buy-in and without sponsorship, Unfortunately, yeah. the efforts are, are going to fall a bit short because you just won't have that the resources that you need to to truly make an effect. Yeah, definitely, definitely. No, very, very useful, very practical. Love it. Um, and Sandra, like, just I think like you have been actually already like hinting a bit, but what would what are like your maybe favorite like reference points when it comes to inclusive design it could be actual product services or like even people and businesses that you particularly admire and why yeah such great points I think like you know I've mentioned Microsoft and I think why I mentioned them is because they've not only created a lot of great products that are putting inclusivity first so I think of like the Xbox um, controller or adaptive controller you know which allowed especially children to fully engage and participate in, in play, like through, through video games. So I would see that they've done a lot of great work on creating toolkits, creating education, creating kind of like a movement in tech, which I feel that a lot of other tech companies have followed. Um, so they would be kind of someone that comes to mind immediately. I would say that there are a specific set of thought leaders. Um, so for instance, I really closely follow the work of Sasha Constanza Schock, who I mentioned earlier. She's the author of Design Justice, the book I have somewhere here, but um, to me, it's also about bringing or following kind of practitioners who are not traditional designers. And I think it's, it's really interesting to 
just kind of engage in disciplines that are a bit outside of your own or learn from people who have been doing this sort of work under different lights and in other sectors. And I think a lot of times people get stuck with like, how do I get started? Like, there's no one doing this work. I'm like, actually, there's a lot of people doing this work. It's just that it, there may not be an industry set of best practices. There may not be like an end to end playbook that exists, but there are people like Sasha Constanza Shock, someone else I follow is Pierce, um, up to, I always say his last name wrong, Pierce. I have it up here, Otto Gilles Gordon, <laughs> but I think it goes by Pierce Gordon sometimes. Great, great thought leader. I follow Alva Villamila as well, who runs a humanity-centered community with Vivian Castillo. I think they're both fantastic. They're um, designers slash researchers um, who bring a really interesting lens to discussion around, especially bringing equity and justice and self-care into the UX world and into tech. Um, trying to think of other people, Oveta Samson, who I've already mentioned. I think there's also Ruja, just to make sure I'm not mispronouncing names. Um, I am mispronouncing her name, but I will find it and send it afterwards. But the author of Race After Technology, Ruha, there we go, Ruha Benjamin, uh, another fantastic thought leader. And I think it's like we have to, this is my personal opinion, but following those who can challenge our mindsets, so who are coming in, even with an academic or a theoretical lens, and challenging that with kind of the practical side of things. And I think people tend to want to jump to, let me put it into practice, let me jump to action right away. But a lot of the inclusive design kind of work or equity design, design justice, whatever label you want to use, it has to do a lot within here, with critical reflection, with introspection, and with mindset change. And so to me, in terms of a learning journey, that's where it has to start. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully we can have a lot of resources in the library for people to kind of work through, but definitely be, um, have a list already of some resources to add to the yeah. reward library. Thank yeah. you so much. And I, I find it like very interesting now because you also like you came into inclusive design as, as a journey, like you didn't start it off as like an inclusive designer, like people can come through like different disciplines and, and it's a lot about like the mindset and the principles. So um, if you think about someone who might want to start uh, including like uh, this lens or like inclusive design approaches to to their work, like what would be maybe tips I mean some resources like already a lot of resources we mentioned but what would be like maybe your uh, key tips to get started somehow yeah I would say that um, the way that I try to approach things are to start with looking at yourself and it's a lot of times you know when you're designing you're designing for other people and so again you fall into this trap of Okay, trap is maybe a harsh word, but you fall into this kind of dynamic of I need to go out and understand what other people need, what they desire, what motivates them, what frustrates them and design for them. And a lot of times you kind of leave yourself as a designer or innovator, or whatever role you play, you leave yourself out of the equation. And so to me, like this work starts with you. So figuring out like, who are you? Or you can ask yourself the question, who am I? So thinking through of like, what are my lived experiences? What um, what social groups do I inhabit or do I fall into or do people associate me with just in terms of their perception? And understanding kind of what are the assumptions or the beliefs that are associated with those social identities and in what ways may I be benefiting from both privilege but also from kind of disadvantages in society on the basis of my identity and of my lived experiences. And I think like this introspective work has to be the foundation of any sort of approach to inclusive design, because if it's not, then you will likely jump into trying to remedy or to correct, for instance, instances of bias or to try to mitigate harm in what you're building. And a lot of times people think it's just bias. And you mentioned, you know, for instance, that we all have cognitive bias. And I was like, yes, but this is a tiny fraction of, of things. Like you have to be able to zoom out and understand that bias tends to be a representation of the fact that we are in a society that is regulated by uh, systems of oppression, meaning uh, these sorts of kind of belief systems that make their ways into our laws, into our constitutions, into social norms, 
into practices, including those in the business um, sector. And it means that there's actually a lot of things below the surface that go beyond just, you know, our brain taking shortcuts and making assumptions. And so I think that that's where a lot of the, to me, the first step is actually engaging in a lot of work that people go through when they're exploring diversity, equity, and inclusion for the first time. Um, and I think that there are a lot of great thought leaders as well on that front, because I've mentioned thought leaders in the design and innovation space, but there are thought leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space who have helped me tremendously to understand the history, for instance, of colonialism, to understand the history of white supremacy, to understand how all of these kind of forces end up making their way into our business, the businesses that we work in, and also the types of products that we earn services or environments or experiences, whatever you're designing, all the stuff that we build. So, so yeah, that's step one. And I think step two is actually understanding, you know, what does bias and inequity look like? So what are actual examples of products and services or solutions that are not so exclusive? Like there's tons of articles and resources out there where people kind of unpack what that looks like. I've written some myself. So just kind of understanding, you know, what are the patterns to look for? Um, how does that show up? And then, of course, asking yourself the question, why? Why is this showing up? Like, why did this make it through all these rounds of testing? Or why did someone not call this out earlier? And that's when you start to understand and kind of see connections between design processes, but also organizational culture. And then, again, these bigger systems that, that we're all operating under. Um, so I have actually a resource list that I send people where I've, like, put together um you know, podcasts, some books, some articles that I think are really good to just kind of have that baseline understanding, including a great book from, I have it here actually, this book. Sorry. This, this is a great book. So, Shell Mian Kim, The Wake Up. So if you want an introduction to all things diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace, it's a really great place to start. She does Amazing. a great job. But, yeah, just kind we of. We'll make sure to add them. all these resources yes. to our <laughs> library. That's that's fantastic. Thank you, Sandra. And I think it's a reflection that I I would make is that at the end, like whatever change we want to bring to the world, it really starts with us uh, thinking who we are, reflecting who we are, where we come from, and then think about okay. What's the contribution that we want to make to these words? So it's really, really yeah. important. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. gonna even add one final thing, and that it's just like then it's just a question. Like once you understand like all this baggage, you know, the history, who you are, your role in things, like these systems, how it shows up in the workplace and in products and services, then you start to think of, well, I can't solve for this like overnight. So what are the tiny kind of practical steps that I can take today? And a simple thing is thinking about language. So it's kind of like, what words am I using? You know, it could be something as simple as pronouns. So if I'm designing something and I'm trying to be inclusive along the lines of gender, you know, if I'm designing an interface or a form and I, am I thinking of a way for people to be able to identify themselves freely with any pronouns that they wish to um, to use, you know, am I designing that in a way that people can do that in kind of my output? Or it's a question of thinking of, you know, maybe I'm using language that isn't gender neutral. Like what are the changes that I can, you know, make on a day-to-day -day basis to get rid of the word, you know, guys, like, hey guys, instead of that, maybe I could say, hey folks, or hey all, or hey everybody. And even just that tiny change, like can accumulate over time like even using your pronouns in zoom and just like creating a space where people feel welcome and that they can kind of if they feel safe they can bring their full selves um to an environment and that comes with kind of practicing that yourself like showing up that way in uh, spaces that you operate in and making kind of the smaller day-to-day -day changes and and what you do and what you build yeah yeah and maybe just to wrap it up um Sandra, like, of course, you are doing a tons of things uh, to advance, like, uh, responsible innovation through inclusive, inclusive design. So maybe how can people connect with your work so that we can share it with them? Yeah, sure. So like I mentioned, I go under the alias Sandra by Design. So I'm on all social media. Uh, so Instagram, which I'm really new on, but it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, 
be ramped up very soon. So try to use that as an education portal, especially for people who are just starting out um, on Twitter at Sandra by Design as well. LinkedIn, uh, you can just Google or not Google, but you can search for me under Sandra Camacho or Sandra by Design. I run a community as well called the Inclusive Design Jam. So you can join us there if you want to keep the conversation going. We'll be doing some trainings very soon for those who want to dig a bit dig a bit deeper. And so that's available at inclusivedesignjam.com. And then my website, if you do want to check a little bit more of my workout and the writing that I do on these topics, you can find me at sandrabydesign.com. Lovely. And yeah, any final words that you would like maybe to share with the reward, rewired audience? Yeah, I'd say the biggest thing is that you can't do this sort of work on your own. And so the most that you can do to try to find community of like-minded folks who share your values, who are going to challenge you and hold you accountable. And I'm not saying that has to be in the inclusive design jam, you know, the space is welcome and open for you, but wherever you find community, whether that's in your own organization, in a virtual Slack group, um, in your like local city, but just the idea is that this work needs to be done as a collective and also thinking of, you know, how can we make space and hold space for people who are very different from us. Um, those who may have been overlooked or silenced in the past, like how can we hold and make space for them to ensure that they, their voices get heard? So that would be kind of my final takeaway for this. Thank you so much. Very appreciated. Right. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Olga.